the story of you today overcoming failure. There's life happens in every one of our life journeys and there are moments in time that can define us but don't need to. Failures happen. Sometimes failures that we commit on our own. We didn't intend to. We didn't mean to. Things happen. We can get distracted and not focused. Make decisions that can cause trouble. There are some when failures come that sit in those failures and allow those things to define them and their future. But that's not what happens when we put our life in God's hands. We won't be defined by our failures. Jesus has come to reverse that curse of failure and turn it into something grand and amazing and beautiful. Today we're going to talk about how to overcome failures. Sometimes the failures we need to overcome aren't things we did ourselves, but the circumstances that surround us, others and their actions, failures that are in this world can impact us. We can succumb to those pressures as well if we're not careful and think that, well, it's nothing we can do. Actually, there's a lot we can do to overcome failures when we realize the partner we have in the person of Jesus and what he's come to do. He will redefine the moments we're in and turn them into something spectacular. It feels to me like what we've experienced worldwide over these last two years could be in that category. What others have done to us. Things out of our control. A virus, a sickness, a, the response to that around the world and all the things that we have been subject to. It feels overwhelming at times and we're still coming through it. It appears that we may get on the other side of that soon. That's my prayer. I'm sure that's yours, that things will get back into a rhythm that we can remember. Hopefully we can remember. It's been so long now since we were in that rhythm. These things that we are going through and been through don't need to define us either. They're being used for God to do something even greater the things that we go through are not meant to define us. They're meant to empower us. We're going to learn how to overcome failure together. Other people, when they fail, those things can be really distracting at times too. And if we're not careful, we can give up on people that might have hurt us or failed us. The very thing that we would hope someone would provide for us if we fail we are not always good at providing for others when they fail. I know that if I stumble, one, thing, one of the things I would cherish is forgiveness. When I hurt someone, my hope is that we can walk through that experience and find healing. That the people on the other side of my trial or what I've caused would have grace for me to say, hey, We'll walk through that. We'll forgive. We'll go forward. We'll get stronger in the journey. In a lot of ways, it's the picture of marriage. Kathy and I have been married for 42 years. It'll be 43, 43 this August. And in that journey, I don't say that for, for that response, but thank you. And it's an opportunity over 43 years to learn how to forgive to learn how to grow. And when we realize that some of our habits or ways that we are, our personalities are uniquely different. Kathy has strengths I don't have. And there are times when I should have learned enough to grow and know what I could do best to serve her, how to love her, that sometimes it doesn't come natural to me. There are things that I'm thinking I'm loving her through the way I serve and I may come up short on what her, is her best need. And so we walk in forgiveness for one another and have and continue to and then keep seeking to grow. It's the picture of life. How can we overcome failure? God wants to help us take the things that have happened and build into them something great. So the thing I hope I receive from others 
I want to translate that in how I can give that to the people that have hurt me. And there are times I look back on the journeys and crazy things happen in life. There are people that have hurt me along the way and had consequences sometimes for those things. And I could just kind of let that go and write that off and not be there for that person to say, hey, let's see what we can do to restore. Sometimes the hurt is deep and we'd rather just move on and we don't give God a chance to work in that person's life and when he does, then we need to be ready to restore and find our way through. The thing I want from God, the thing I want from you, the thing I want from people close to me, I need to be ready to give to you, to others who might have wounded me in the journey. It's part of our learning process. We're going to look at the story of Peter in this journey. The Gospel of John in chapter 18, Peter was known as one of the disciples who is really strong, strong-willed, strong man. He was a fisherman. He was kind of that all guy kind of guy. And very impetuous, whatever's on his mind, he's going to say when Jesus was being arrested and the guards came for him in the garden, Peter's like, we're not having that. He pulls out his sword. He's going to do battle with these soldiers that approach. And Jesus is asking him not to, but before he could help himself, he pulls out his sword and whacks off the ear of one of the soldiers and then Jesus calms this moment, picks the ear up and helps the guy attach it. And it's an amazing moment. But that's Peter. You can kind of like the guy for some of his impetuousness and some of the way that he rolled in life. But there are other elements of that that he wasn't always using wisdom. Peter's, sometimes people get on Peter for, you know, Jesus was out walking on the water and they see him coming and Peter's like, hey, I'm going to go to him and he gets out of the boat and he's actually walking on the water too until he realizes what he's doing and he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he sinks like a rock. Peter the rock acted like one in that moment. Sometimes we get on him for a kick. Man, you were doing it. Why'd you take your eyes off of Jesus? Look, nobody else got out of the boat. He's the only dude. Everybody else knew they were going to sink, so they didn't even try. There's elements of Peter that's pretty amazing. I, I kind of feel attracted to some of the qualities that he possessed, but he also, in his ways, was quick to fail. Here we have the story of Jesus when he's being arrested. These disciples have been walking with him for three years. They were close as you can be believing that he's going to be the guy that sets up their kingdom. And they're all in. And now the time comes that Jesus predicted that he's going to give himself up. Peter still is not understanding that. And he's saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to be there for you, Jesus, no matter what. And Jesus tells him before it even happens, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. And he's like, what? Not a chance. No way on this planet that's ever going to happen. I will not do that. And Jesus is like, well, you're going to do it three times and then the rooster is going to crow. And when that happens, you'll know, you know, you, you did what, uh, what you did. And he's like, not going to, not going to happen. So here we are in the middle of Jesus being turned over to the guards. He's now going in for trial. And as Jesus has already taken on some abuse and the disciples and followers of him are scared now, like, what in the world? How is this happening? They really didn't think this was going to happen. Even though Jesus said it was, they couldn't comprehend it. And Peter turns from being that rough and tumble guy that just cut off the guard's ear to being afraid. And this is where we pick up the story in John chapter 18. And beginning at verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, 
he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Here's the guy who's like, I will never deny you. In the moment of this tension and pressure, we can say all kinds of things to Jesus that we mean when we said it. I know Peter meant it when he said, I'll not do that. Um, I will never deny you. He meant it. He knew in his heart of hearts he would not ever deny Jesus. And then he finds him in a set of, himself in a set of circumstances that he'd never been in before. And the fear rose up. And he sees what's happening to his leader. And he's like, he doesn't want that to happen to himself. And sure enough, in the heat of the matter, he says, yeah, I'm, I'm not one of his. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. We jump down to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, people standing around there doing the same, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? Same question, different person. He denied it and said, I am not. Strike two. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. Now, does Peter know he's talking to a relative of the dude that he just whacked his ear off? Like, this can't be good. You know, blood is thicker than water. Family's going to stand up for family. And now the guy that's a relative of that guy asks, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. No, it wasn't me. I don't know, I don't know what you saw. It surely wasn't me. And at once, a rooster crowed. And when this happened, and you can read the story in other gospels, in Luke's gospel, there's a moment where Peter can see Jesus and Jesus can see Peter and the rooster crows and he catches his eye in the middle of his trial and you can see the disappointment and the sorrow in Jesus' eyes and he realizes he did what he said he would never do. He failed. This rock, this strong, manly man, I will never deny you, just did it three times. And the rooster reminded him that's what Jesus said would happen and it says, Peter went out and wept bitterly. In Luke's gospel, you see that statement about what happened next. Peter was heartbroken. What do you do now after failure occurs of that level? Here's a principle that we can walk in that Peter did actually as we continue his story. Overcome failure through hope. As long as you follow Jesus, you have hope. Here in this moment, it seems like the worst possible moment in life for Peter ever. And yet he realizes what happened and he takes time to acknowledge it like, hey, I just failed. And he's still connecting his heart to Jesus and Jesus has always promised hope. This doesn't look very hopeful. Peter's worried that he's going to come under the same kind of outcome that Jesus that he's following is under. But now he remembers other things about what Jesus said, that he's going to endure this. He's going to die. He's going to be buried, but he's going to be raised to life, Jesus promised on the third day. And as you follow Jesus, even through failure, even through dark days, even through things that seem impossible, even through things that seem like they've died in your life. What do you do when a business fails? It's like dead. What do you do with that kind of pressure? What do you do walking through what we've been walking through? There are some businesses that have flourished during this COVID season. 
other businesses that have completely been destroyed. Those in the food services, so many just completely destroyed by the outcome and the impact of this pandemic. What do you do when you're walking through things and some of it feels like out of your control, some of it could be our own decisions we've made that bring about calamity on ourselves. What do you do when pressures are mounting? When you follow Jesus, he's like, there's resurrection, there's, there's hope. This can still become something great. Even if something dies, there's something that's gonna come out of that grave to a supernatural, spectacular future. Jesus was raised to life on the third day. Peter finds hope in following him. You and I need to find that same hope. Do you feel like you've ever failed? The circumstances around you broken down? It can be in relationships. You know, we, we have failed marriages and it feels like, man, that's just crushing and something died. And it can feel so debilitating, like I, I'm not ever gonna find my joy again. And yet when you follow Jesus, he's always giving hope. Actually, you know, there's resurrection, there's something new. There's something beautiful that's about to happen. Jesus is all about the next. He's all about the new. He's all about grace that covers and then giving us a new start, a new hope, a new possibility. What is it that has happened? What thing that has crushed us might turn into something quite dynamically beautiful? Failure is not the end of the story. Jesus is in the restoration business. He longs to meet with you. He longs to forgive you. He longs to empower you, you personally. This isn't a message for all those other people. This is not a truth that's for everyone else but you. We can get ourselves in that quagmire of thinking, yeah, it sounds good, but you don't know me. You don't know my circumstance. Like, this is hopeless. It's never hopeless when you follow Jesus. If we're not following him, we can get stuck. If we don't realize that he's still there for us, even when everything else seems missing, everything else seems dark and gone, if we think that, we can lose hope, but if we find Jesus in the middle of it, he's going to renew our hope. He will renew our vision. He'll show us something that is about ready to break out into victory. I look at circumstances today in, in the church world, you know, church life is my life, like it's my job, and I follow other leaders. And when I look back on church history, and people, some people I know have had some breakdowns and it can be really hurtful to churches when a leader stumbles. There's some that I stay up to date with that are even recent and I read about one this week and it's heartbreaking because that leader didn't ever really mean to go there. It wasn't like they set out to cause harm or to stumble themselves. Life is filled with pressures. We are human. No matter what job a person has, even if it's a religious job, a spiritual job, it doesn't cause that person to be immune from all kinds of trials and adversities. We have to keep fighting, keep working, keep trying to stay on top of the pressures that come. And what I see in the lives of those who have had breakdowns is there's still hope. It's not time to write somebody off. It's time to deal with it for sure, but then what might be next? How might that adversity actually turn out to write a new story that could be even greater than the one that had preceded it? Our God is in the business of restoration. He's in the business of forgiveness, of empowering, of changing things. So we get to John 21, and this is after these moments that Peter has walked through. He has failed. He's feeling it. Jesus dies. He's feeling that. He knows Jesus said he would come back to life, but he's not sure. How could you know? Like That's, that's way out there. Crazy talk. 
But Jesus said it. He didn't have to wait long. On the third day after Jesus' death, he comes back to life and he appears to people. Jesus in his resurrected form shows, comes to the disciples. Thomas like, that can't be him. And Jesus is like, well, check out the nail prints in my hands and my feet. Check out the hole in my side where they pierced me through with a sword. And Thomas checks that out and he's so stunned. It's him. He's risen. And now their hopes are renewed. When you follow Jesus, even when you lose your hope, even when you lose your way, even when that sounds like crazy talk that I could ever get out of this. Somebody has told me that I might be able to somehow recover, but I can't see it. It sounds like crazy talk. Well, just wait. On the third day, resurrection came. Now Jesus comes to his disciples. He comes to them when they're fishermen on the seashore. It could be that Peter, in his failure, thought, I'm just going to go back to my old job. And he gets back to the lake. And they're fishing. And Jesus tells them where to throw the nets. And they're like, what? They do that. And they bring in the huge catch. And they have a breakfast barbecue. And Jesus sits with them for breakfast. That's where we find John 21 in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him, Jesus is saying a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So much said of this experience and the typology of it where Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus always gives hope, and now he meets with Peter and quizzes him about his devotion, and Peter is very sincere. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. Second time, do you love me? I said I did. I mean it. Feed my sheep. A third time, do you love me? He's like, Upset, grieved, like, why are you saying that? I'm telling you the truth. You know everything, and you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. And those three denials get turned into three affirmations. And there's a full restoration. And Peter goes from a mess to having a mantle of opportunity and authority on him overnight. His recovery didn't take Years, his recovery came in days. And on the 50th day after Jesus' resurrection, the day of Pentecost, there's a moment when the Spirit is poured out on those praying in the upper room and people are gathering and there's a big commotion. It's the beginning of the New Testament church. It's the first church ever born. And Peter is the guy to talk Peter's the messenger, the big failure. The guy who said, I'll never deny you, did it. He didn't know if he could recover. He didn't know what was going to happen. But hope is restored through following Jesus. We need to be willing to step into our destiny. Peter was willing. What if Peter would have, because of his mess, kind of retreated into his mess and said, I'm I'm done. What if he would have followed the path of Judas? Judas betrayed Jesus for money. Judas, he, he could have recovered. He retreated into his failure. Instead of thinking that there's any possibility that I could be forgiven, and he goes out and takes his own life. Peter could have done that. 
He could have gone the other way. But Jesus is always saying to us, no, there's hope. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't walk away. Walk in to me. Come to me and I will give you hope. Come to me and I will set a new pay, new path in front of you and give you a new strength that you never knew you had. And Peter gets restored. He's willing to step into his destiny. Sometimes we fail and we're like, ah, I'm, I'm out. I can't do anything. Like, look at me. No, actually, you might be able to do even greater things because of what you've been through. You've got more to offer than someone that hasn't been through what you've been through. Somebody needs what you've got. Somebody needs to hear the story of your failure. Be willing to step into your destiny. Listen to the story of Mila. Challenges through her life. Serious battles. Choices. What do you do? Myla steps into her destiny. Hear it from her lips. Myla's here today to share her story with you. We captured it on a video. I think she's in the house, but let's watch this first. I am a generational curse breaker. I am the first in my family to receive an education, graduate from a university, and earn a BSW. Before my walk with God, I was a lost child. I suffered from depression because of a divorce from my mother and father. With that divorce, we were forced to relocate. Once we relocated, I had to make new friends and find a new school. I felt neglected by my father, so with the neglect, I became rebellious and misbehaving. With all of that, I became suicidal. At the age of 15 years old, I had a failed suicide attempt. With that failed suicide attempt, I discovered that I was pregnant and carrying twins. Being a single mom at 15 years old with twins was very difficult. I had no direction or no guidance. I wanted to break a generational curse, and I wanted to not be a statistic. I wanted more for my twin daughters. So with no background, no religious background, not knowing how to pray or recite a scripture from the Bible, I fell to my knees. Falling to my knees, I prayed to God and I asked God to please give me direction. With that direction, I accepted God. Once I accepted God, I dealt with rejection. This rejection from family and friends caused me to isolate. The isolation made me more depressed. I knew that this was not what God wanted for me. So I told myself, I'm going to continue to keep the faith. I left everything behind and I moved to California. Moving to California, I was homeless. I had no vehicle, I had no friends, and I decided that I wanted to keep pushing forward. Living in my father's garage, one Sunday morning, I decided that I was gonna get up and walk. I walked and I found this huge building, Capital Christian Center. I walked into the building not knowing anyone, not having any background of Capital Christian Center, and I walked into service. After listening to service is when I realized that I was home. I got plugged into Capital Christian Center. I was welcomed. And that's when I decided to join groups. So I decided to join the group Rooted. I got connected with friends that walk the same life and share some experiences with me. And I befriended a few people in the group. And today we are friends. We go hiking together. We talk. We wish each other happy holidays. And it's just amazing. With Rooted, I learned how to be a disciple. I learned discipleship and how to walk with God and follow the Lord. And with that, I can tell you that today, I am a changed person, I am happy, and I have accepted Christ in my heart. That is my story. Myla's twin daughters are in their 20s. They live in New Jersey. One of them studying to be a nurse, the other is a manager of a restaurant, and they're thriving, and it's destiny that Myla stepped into after having much adversity. 
Mylar, are you here? I don't even know for sure. Stand if you are somewhere. Uh, um, over here. Oh, there you are. Blessings to you. Thank you for being willing to share your story and stepping into the destiny and it's continuing to evolve. And I know God will use you. Thank you so much for being a part of our capital family. All right, blessings to you. Let me wrap up with this thought. Your, your failures are the seeds of your victories. Your failures are the seeds of your victories. They get sown into the ground, it's gonna burst forth into the most beautiful plant, the most beautiful outcome you could imagine. God always redeems those things that are broken, those things that are seemingly lost. He's going to bring about a resurrection. So Peter preaches this message in Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. This is after his failure. He's been restored by the hope found in Jesus. He's willing to step into his destiny. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. They were speaking in other languages. The people thought they were not in their right mind. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Receive this as a word for today. This is a word the prophet Joel gave that was for that day, it's for this day. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's hard to imagine everything that he's predicting and saying. But we live in a day that, man, all these things seem like they happen. Like, there have been fires, there have been earthquakes, there's been tsunamis there's been so many things in the earth that's just in great utter turmoil and it's happening in these great and magnificent and horrifying days of the end of time but for everyone who's willing to see Jesus and to follow him one can step into their destiny and it shall come to pass that everyone everyone without exception who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved that's the day we're living in. It's a day with so much trouble, so much turmoil. People are ready for some hope. People are ready for, is that possible? I thought everything was so dark and so miserable and I'm such a failure, there's no more hope. No, there's always hope when Jesus is in the house. And when you hear his voice and you see his face and you are attracted to what he can do, he's going to bring restoration out of the darkness, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in verse 40, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word, that's an important word, those who received his word, people are ready to receive a good word. We've got a good word today. I'm sharing with you a good word today. This is a good word. Do you have failures? So do I. Let's recover. Let's receive grace. Let's receive forgiveness. Let's give it out to one another. Let's see what we can do to step in willingly to our destiny. There's other people waiting for this message of hope. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. One day. 3,000 believers. That was the birth of the church that we sit in here today, the New Testament church, the church after Jesus' resurrection and ascension to heaven. It's a new day. It's a new church. Here we are today because Peter 
overcame his failure and stepped into his destiny willingly and was used as a tool to share the good news. And whoever receives him receives everlasting life. Lord Jesus, we pray today for your help in responding to your truth. Thank you for your forgiveness. I pray if there's anyone feeling the pain of sin or failing, failing, that there would be grace right now to cover it, to wash it away, to renew hope, renew that hope in us. If you need his grace today, just pray this prayer. Jesus, I believe in you and I thank you for what you've done to provide forgiveness for me. I receive it. I believe in you. I want to follow you. I want to receive my destiny through you. Renew my hope. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.